Friends, welcome to a video. It's content week! I'm so excited! I'm here to make a little bit of content for you. Uh, may or may not be making a draft analysis, but what I thought I would do is do a little analysis of the whole board, of the metagame. In fact, three draft boards. So we'll be comparing the Scarlet Violet, Naranja Uva, and my practice draft, draft boards. Looking at the boards and at the teams that came out of that, looking at quirks and tiering, um, mega steals or things that were overpriced to learn for next season. These things are probably obvious, but I may, by looking at all three of these in totality, be able to observe some things, some things, some things, that um, the current moderation team has not yet noticed. Uh, and also potentially give some insight on the further metagame. That's really the point, uh, is to know about how our games are going to be played uh, and what to prioritize in drafting, what is important for a team to have, uh, and have some learnings from that. But first, practice draft? Yes, I, uh, I did a practice draft just by myself, um, like we have done uh, in past seasons for Day Plan Part 2. We did a, a couple practice drafts, uh, and I wanted to do that just by myself. I drafted it as all eight, uh, as all eight, as all 12 teams. Um, it's not perfect. The teams that I put together were just kind of going back and forth, imagining I was drafting as them taking no more than two or three minutes per pick to figure out what they should be taking, which still meant I put a lot of thought in, um, but it's nothing compared to the actual amount of effort each of us is putting in to preparing our teams, and it's just me. So my biases are gonna be super obvious, which you'll see when we look at the draft boards. Um, I will say in, in the four BBL seasons that I've been part of, uh, I've had maybe two, two and a half good teams. Uh, Jordan ranked my BDSP team uh, first overall for, uh, I, think, I think it was just the league, I think it was just one division. Um, and Dan just ranked my Paul Dea team first on his power rankings, so I think the practice draft board is reasonable enough, having been, toge been put together by a reasonable enough drafter. Uh, but let's get moving on some of these observations. Um, oh, is that GIF gonna... Okay, anyways. <laughs> so, uh, the first thing we're gonna be looking at is the whole draft board. Uh, so I've made up a doc uh, that has each of the three different divisions that we're considering here um, listed next to the Pokemon. So this is the eight and nine point tiers. Now the first thing you'll notice is I've highlighted the Pokemon that were only drafted one time. Of the eight and nine point tiers across my practice draft and the two from BBLS, uh, every Pokemon in one of these, threes, these three tiers um, was drafted. That's clearly my bias, uh, having come from a, like a singles draft league history, I think I go for those like top tiers, especially when doing practice drafts. It's like, well, of course I'm going to take one of the top tiers. Um, I'm not as likely to make risky choices like uh, one brim, for example. But if you look here, um, I've highlighted the Pokemon that only got taken once, which are probably the ones that are overpriced, or maybe that can tell us something else. So Gothitelle, Gyarados, Torkoal, Tyranitar, and Gastrodon. Um, I think all of these Pokemon were probably overpriced, maybe with the exception of Torkoal, although you could make an argument that Tyranitar is a uh, is a nine-point viable Pokemon as well. Um, but you can also note, you know, which Pokemon got to taken all three times, um, or really these, like, huge attackers or really clear support pieces. And I think the thing with um, Gothitelle, um, amongst the rest of these is even though it's phenomenal support, it's a great trigger setter, helping hand, fake out, and shadow tag, obviously. It's a bit hard to think about drafting around shadow tag. In my practice draft, I drafted it alongside Meowskarada as a way to um, really pick it next to a fast and strong attacker. Uh, but I think it may be indicative that this board does not have as strong of hyper offensive options if Gothitelle is not being taken in either division um, from the VBLS draft board. Uh, the rest of these, I would say, are probably just slightly over-tiered. The synergies with Torkoal and Tyranitar are very obvious. Tyranitar has Lycanroc, Houndstone. Um, Torkoal has Scovillain and Lilligant. It's possible, though, that the lack of Excadrill, lack of Venusaur, lack of even, like, a Victory Bell, uh, or a, a Charizard as a Solar Power Abuser, um, make these Pokémon significantly worse as far as their synergies go. I have no doubt the Torkoal will be going first round when we're, um, using the Paradox Pokemon. But until that point, uh, perhaps 
their damage output and raw power uh, and raw power? Their damage output and team synergy abilities is just not quite what people are looking for on this board. Moving on to the 6 and 7 point tiers, I consider these still top tier Pokemon. They're all very strong Pokemon. You can see, you know, the 6 point tier even has stuff like Garganacle, um, Dondozo, uh, Sylveon, stuff you see all the time on the ladder. Um, so again, I'm highlighting mainly the Pokemon that didn't get picked at all. Now here there's a lot more to look at. Um, you definitely have some like clear synergy Pokemon. Every draft board has a couple of these at the top. Uh, Houndstone, Ndidi, uh, Barrascuta, arguably Drifblim if you really see it as an unburdened Pokemon, although I would say, um, or Jamie Boyd would say, the Flare Boost set is just as good, uh, if not better, than the unburdened set since there's so little terrain around here. Barrascuta obviously didn't get taken by Mono and so, uh, did not end up getting drafted because he really wanted on rain. Although, I would argue that it actually performed better on my rain team when I didn't rain Politoed. Um, but there's a couple other Pokemon to look at as well. Medicham, Gallade, and Breloom are all high tier fighting types. And I think the reason they didn't get picked is just because even though they're very, very strong, they're a bit difficult to use because they're not super bulky. And that fighting type, especially with the psychic and the grass types, is giving them a lot of weaknesses. Weaknesses to Ghost, Flying, Fairy, uh, to name a few, are going to make those Pokemon difficult to position. Uh, and even though they have huge ceilings in power, I expect them to be... Uh, one risky drafter is going to have to take them one season and really show off just how much they can do. It's interesting because Glade is one of those Pokemon that's so strong now and has incredible versatility, and it still didn't get picked. That may be just our mindset from previous generations, not remembering that Sharpness gives it essentially a free choice band boost on those um, non-contact Psycho Cut and, and Sacred Sword as well. Night Slash, Leaf Blade, etc. But it is uh, interesting to note, in my opinion, that Glade didn't get picked. I think the others of these, Yuenichan may have been a little bit of a price being so frail, but huge power and fake out is strong. Uh, we've all done here as well, not a fighting type, um, but performs similarly to Metacham. Really strong hitter, much faster than Metacham, has the fake out, has a lot of good support, uh, but I think Weavile is one of those Pokemon that, because you can get a lot of what it offers in other places, outside of fake out, you know, you can get a fast snarl other places, you can get that fast icy wind, um, you can get good damage, and there's plenty of dark and ice types, I would say, on this board. Um, I guess it just didn't really land with people. Now, in the six point tier, uh, Driftblim, I think, is very interesting, being a, a phenomenal Tailwind and Trick Room Setter being immune to Fake Out and having quite reasonable bulk. This thing is not going down in one hit to too many things when you invest it in the right defensive side. Um, it's curious that it didn't get taken. Again, I think this may be an example of we think of Driftblim as being a terrain Pokemon, but really, because of its ability to set Trick Room now, it might be a, a top tier Trick Room Setter as well. Um, so I would definitely be expecting Driftblim to go in earlier rounds in, in future leagues, but Perhaps there's something to hate about it uh, that I'm missing. Maybe it's just too expensive compared to the rest of the stuff in six. There are a lot of Tailwind setters on this board, for sure. And Trick Room is not too hard to come out either. Earth's Ring and Vivillon at the bottom. Vivillon, I think, is uh, just the same thing as Butterfree. Maybe a little bit better uh, as Butterfree in, in uh, Gen 8. But again, a little bit hard to use just given the complete and utter frailty, basically forcing you into using the Focus Sash on it. Earth's Ring, I would say, you know, maybe has a similar problem to Vivalon in needing an item, right? Earth Ring was maybe a, a two or three point Mon when it was just a Flame Orb Guts user, but now with Eviolite, it's really a, a bulky attacker, probably setting up a Swords Dance, potentially Belly Drum, but limiting yourself to Eviolite with such a high tier Pokemon, you really don't see that being very common unless you're going for like a Dusclops or a Porygon too. So that could potentially be um, a little bit of learning on why Ursaring wouldn't have gone. I think it's also just notable that normal types are, are a lot harder to fit on uh, teams. They're not completing a core, although I truly don't think um, Ursaring was overpriced by too much. Moving on to the four and five point tiers. Uh, now I've highlighted the Pokemon that got drafted on all three boards and the Pokemon that didn't get drafted at all. These being really, in my opinion, the center of the um, draft board. Not super high tiers, not super low tiers. Uh, first, we'll look at the Pokemon that got drafted a lot. 
So in five points, most of the Pokemon, no, five and four, most of the Pokemon didn't get drafted. The ones that did get drafted all three times were Clawitzer, Electros, Jumpluff, Lucario, Rabska, Rotomo, Sloking, Tinkaton, Vaporeon, Kapraja, Jolteon, Morgrim, Passimian, Tatsugiri, and Toadscroll. So Tatsugiri, Tatsugiri, I think, is the, the most obvious of these. Um, you want to get it with Dondozo. People really want to try that out, figure it out in draft. I personally am not sure how I rate it, given it's very easy to bring Haze, it's easy to bring Clear Smog, it's easy to bring Destiny Bond, or whatever else you want to use to counter it. But it's still very, very strong, uh, and just so tempting to use it, because it's so popular on the ladder. Uh, I think Tatsugiri was probably underpriced for that reason. Uh, but the rest of these, I think, are a little bit more interesting. Um, I would go so far as to say that Tinkaton and Lucario, but potentially Rotomo as well, were clearly underpriced. Toadscrewl as well, as well, I would say. I think what, what these Pokemon offer, Lucario with stab, normal, extreme speed, um, Rotomo just being ultimately better than Rotom Fan and Rotom Frost, that grass typing being helpful for uh, knocking out water types, knocking out ground types, is helpful. An electric type that can beat ground types is quite strong and, and worth taking. It's on my team. Obviously, I rate it highly. Uh, Tinkerton having that solid speed, solid defense, good damage output, and fake out, given the relative rarity of fake out, fairy typing, and steel typing, even if you do think it's worth five, I don't think it's surprising that this went on every board. The rest, uh, I think, are... Oh, Toad Scroll, I would say, yeah, again, a little under, under tiered. I think it's hard to see how it's useful, given the uh, weakness laid in typing and the rough ability, uh, but just the speed and the, the pure move pool, in addition to actually being a ground type, which most teams didn't end up being able to have, at least a, a good one, um, definitely gives it that that edge and makes it worth taking. I think Toad's Cruel would still get drafted if it was in the five point tier, or potentially even higher. As far as the rest goes, um, I think we can learn some interesting information about the draft board from this. What I noticed, first of all, is that three of these Pokemon, if you don't include uh, Tatsugiri, which has its own situation going on, are water types. Uh, Clawitzer, Vaporeon, um, and the... Wait. <laughs> and the slow gang, right. I think um, water types are obviously popular in this format, uh, but I think people are really going to these middle tiers uh, for them. In previous seasons and previous leagues, there were a lot of water types, and I think in this league, there are actually fewer great water types to go around. It's still the most popular typing, but a lot of water types are, you know, guys like Whiskash, guys like Toxapex, guys like Aloma Mola, who have a use, you know, can do something, but to get one that's really good value, uh, that can fit on a team well, not as easy as it would have been in, in previous gens. I almost always left my water types for a later pick, historically, but this generation with um, a rise in, in fire types, for sure. Um, water types, I think, are really important to get, uh, which would be why some of these good ones got uh, taken. Mm. For some of these other guys, Jumpluff, um, Rabska, Slowking, offering some solid roll compression for sure, uh, as well as uh, the Morgrim. Uh, all four of those guys offering really, really solid support um, for their price tier. Um, and for teams that just kind of need one Pokemon to fit that, you know, I need a screen setter, I need a fake out setter. Um, in the case of Slowking, you know, that strong synergy with uh, Ice types versus Titan. Slush Rushers, or really anything that wants to be spamming Blizzard, um, while also having Trick Room and a good amount of damage output. Rapsco being really valuable for Trick Room and that Special Attack stat and Revival Blessing. I think there's a lot of value in that. I think the last category we have here is um, the uh, the Copperaja and the Passimian, or I think are just strong attackers. Passimian, I would say, is probably a little under tiered, or just the best fighting type in the tier, and fighting is classically one of those Pokemon that you wait until one of the middle rounds to pick. That's definitely how my team ended up operating, uh, having Passimian on it. And I think that's interesting. Uh, it ended up getting taken in all three boards, I would say, because midway through the draft, people probably saw their teams being weak to rock, and 
just not having enough to handle steel types, and so boom, there's your dash to grab that Missimian. Defiant, I neglected to mention completely because truly I don't think it's very um, helpful in this uh, generation, but of course Intimidate is still around. I see when Snarl Snap Drops gonna force people to play around that. And then there's the Jol uh, Jolteon? Yeah, the Jolteon and the Electros. Interesting to know that Lu uh, the Luxray didn't get drafted at all, but um, these more offensively leaning electric types um, did get drafted uh, three times. Um, and I guess those guys just ended up being a cut above the rest. Interestingly, Electros with not the best type for terror typing, although um, can be uh, terror typing into its coverage uh, options, and Jolteon being um, super fast, making good use of that I uh, ice type terror type. I think there's definitely um, some clear reasons to go for those guys. Uh, and then, I think we've talked about everything in those tiers. Kaparaja just pretty clearly being a super strong trick room attacker. I think what makes it so pickable is just how clearly Kaparaja can fit on a team. Don't have a steel type, don't have a slow Pokemon, boom, you have it, you're done. Let's look at the Pokemon that didn't get drafted in these tiers. Oh, okay, my tea is finally the right temperature. Not a lot of jokes in this one, okay? I'm a very serious guy. I'm focusing exclusively on the facts of the matter. Mm, analytical time. Okay. In five, Dragology, Luxray, Oracorio, and Benkirchen. In four, Dunsparce, Fortress, Komala, and Poltegeist. Now, all these Pokemon, you can see, have a lot to offer to a team. At least in five. I suppose potentially a reason that Dunsparce, Fortress, and Komala didn't get taken is it's, it is hard to see what they give. Dunsparce has that Glare and Serene Grace uh, headbutt ability, a Fortress being a Steel type with 40, uh, 40, 90 attack and relatively okay defenses, pretty solid defenses, and a great defensive typing. Kamala being a normal type immune to status? Not really sure what Kamala's doing here. I think Kamala could definitely have been one of the, um, one of the weaker picks. Uh, let's just get the music going. Um, from four, which is why nobody took it. But these Pokemon are all overly defensive, I would say. Um, really slow tempo type Pokemon. Poltegeist, on the other hand, being too fast. I think it's a, you know, shell smashing setup, but the risk of that probably made people shy away from that. Even with Terra Blast making Poltegeist a truly terrifying sweeper. Uh, and in the five point tier, Dragology, Luxray, or Corio, Pinkurchin. I think all these Pokemon have their issues for different reasons. Dragology with uh, adaptability plus Terra is, is crazy strong. Um, I think it's just that typing. You want your poison type to be able to beat fairies, I think, is, is an important thing. Um, and Dragology just ends up not being one of those top tier dragon types with something new and exciting to offer, so it falls by the wayside. Also, not quite slow enough to be the most effective Trip Grim Sweeper. And in this greater size decks, there are a good amount of 29 and, and 30 base speed Pokemon that are still going to be underspeeding Trick Algae in Trick Room. Luxray, I think, is a clear victim of the uh, Covert Cloak. Not the Covert Cloak. Well, we're a Snarl, but also the clear amulet. Weakening things. It does have a lot of utility, you know, the Guts Boosted Facade, um, Intimidate Volt Switch, obviously, and the Electro Typing are all really valuable. Uh, but I think it just gets let down in its, its stats and is one of those Pokemon that looks really good and fits really easily on the team and then you say, oh, it's not quite fast enough, it's not quite strong enough. It's got the versatility, I would say it's got the versatility, but, excuse me, I think without having a really clear direction as far as damage or damage mitigation or support, something like Fake Out uh, or Speed Control, it just didn't end up getting taken. Oricorio and Pekurchin, on the other hand, both have very clear directions they take you. Oricorio, especially the Sensu form being an unfake outable Tailwind setter with, I believe, 93 speed, uh, and Pinkurchin being a super slow attacker in Trick Room and Electric Terrain setter. I guess the reality is no Rising Voltage, no Alolan Raichu. Really, really hard to um, actually justify getting Pinkurchin on your team, unless you're really running with like another Electric type and just trying to spam electric type moves um i think pinkurchin is going to be one of those pokemon that 
Seems like it offers a lot of value, but terrain is taking a huge hit this generation. And it's not going to be until we get those iron Pokemon back that that guy's going to get taken. Or Corio, I would say clearly, even though it's got four forms, it just doesn't have the stats. And that frailty um, is really going to get in its way. Overall, it looks like... Um, when people are taking frail Pokemon, they're really, really going for just the ones with the top tier ability. And when they're taking bulky Pokemon, they're taking ones that still have some reasonable damage output. I think relatively few Pokemon, like the your Umbreons, um, or even your, like, whatever it would be, uh, Toxpexes, um, are getting taken in favor of these Pokemon that can really do, do both. I like to see that BBL is prioritizing versatility in their picks. Here we are in Value Town. I've just highlighted the Pokemon that got taken a lot here. Um, just my, don't mind my screenshots, getting a, the less notable picks crossed out. So here are the Pokemon that got drafted three times um, across all three divisions. I would say almost all of these are Pokemon who must have been under tiered, uh, but we may be able to learn a little bit more about the format as well. So, Camerupt, Appleton, Avalug, Cragnall. Donphan, Flamigo, Flareon, Fungus, Magneton, Persian, and Sandaconda. Doxbun, Impidimp, Scyther, and Toxpex were the ones that got taken in two, and we'll point out Bronzor being the only one-pointer that got taken across both VBL draft boards. None of my um, 12 practice draft teams took Bronzor. But Bronzor's very clear, um, getting that Steel-type Trick Room Setter. If you get to the end of your draft and you realize you didn't pick one, that's going to be the best guy for you. Tier 2, you know, I think a lot of these guys are the... Uh, under tiered ones but we're seeing with impotent you know we are wanting these bulkier teams and so having uh light screen reflect parting shot all make this guy more valuable compared to some of the other style pokemon really being able to support the team i guess it is under tiered doc's bun pretty clearly you know this board is super strapped for fairies so gonna be taken scyther i think was a, a huge under tiering uh i think seeing that it had lost dual wing beat really made us doubt Scyther's abilities, but if you look at the stats with Terra, that's actually a crazy bulky Pokemon. With the ability to set Tailwind, this Pokemon is, you know, rivaling Corviknight as far as its um, bulk and ability to set Tailwind, while still having 105 attack to be able to dish out some reasonable damage. Pex, I think, also got taken for uh, Wide Guard. I think spread moves are going to be super common in this format, and so you can see Pex and Avalug got taken here, being Wide Guard users. Uh, Flamigo as well. Mm. Now, these Pokemon are obviously all a little bit under-tiered, but I think that is enough to show, oh, you know, people really jump into these Pokemon that have these these moves because spread moves are going to be flying out like crazy. Pardon me, excuse me, in this format. Looking at the three-point tier, uh, we've got a couple trends. We've got Sandaconda, Camerupt, and Dawnfan all being gra uh, ground types. So a few ground types on this board. Pretty obvious uh, why those guys got taken. I think there's a clear lesson here to take your ground types early, lest you be one of these three people who ends up having to take a ground type from the three-point tier. Not that Camerupt, Donphan, or Sandaconda were truly awful. Uh, Flareon and Camerupt also are fire types. Also rare for the same reasons. Ground and fire types being so important because every Pokemon can turn into a steel type and get that defensive typing. Having those typings figured out early will help you a lot for sure. Other Pokemon here that I think are definitely under tier. We got some Pokemon here that can beat flying types. Avalug, Cryagonal, uh, Magneton. Uh, well, at least with their with their stab typings. Magneton with the resist. I think these Pokemon were about adequately praised. I would say actually Magneton, given Terra being able to remove its four times weakness to, to ground, could definitely have been up a few tiers. Avalon and Kragonol both do really specific things, being bulky ice types on the uh, special and physical side. Avalug, I think, just doing the same thing as, thing as Appleton, bulking up a lot and um, holding out. But I think that's a clear example for both of them of the power of Terra. Turn Appleton into a water type, turn Avalug into <laughs> a water type, and suddenly you've got a very strong Pokemon setting up with Iron Defense, Body Press being extremely hard to kill. Uh, Kragonal, I think, uh, is a very interesting, weird Pokemon. I think last generation we were interested a lot in those fast, icy wind, electroweb style Pokemon. Uh, Kragonal is one of those, and Covert Cloak slash Terra Ghost will allow it to get that up more consistently. 
I think Cryogonal potentially may have been overrated. I looked at it a lot when I was preparing my draft boards, although that was mainly as a fast uh, Frost Breath if I ended up taking Paldean Tauros. I think for the Icy Wind potential, um, there's just so much Tailwind on this board, it's going to be hard to combo unless you're sending out, you know, Cryogonal and Salamence or something so that Salamence can set Tailwind and then be doing a lot of damage and Cryogonal can be spamming the Icy Wind. Persian and Fungus, I think, are uh, pretty clear what else can be said about them. Solid low tier picks consistently. These guys always end up getting taken in the low tiers, but it's hard to move them back up because they have pretty clear flaws. Um, overall, not exactly sure what the, the lessons from those two being drafted so much would be. Um, besides, you know, people are starting to remember the value of redirection and you're always gonna be going for a fake out. Even if Persian was up higher, I think it would still get taken. Covert Cloak was not enough to make people shy away from taking Persian. Uh, I think the only Pokemon we haven't gone in depth about on this slide is Flamigo, which is pretty clearly a, an unbelievable um, mistake in our tiering, which I was part of. I take responsibility for that. Uh, but that guy has some crazy moves. He's got Tailwind, he's got Quick and Wide Guard. But what he's really got is that strong stab with that Co-Star ability. And with Scrappy. Um, so much versatility in that little bird. Um, really excited to see how Electric and Poppin end up using that. Let's look at some surprises and, and trends from the board. So looking at weather first, Obama Snow, Torkoal, Tyranitar, and Pelipper are really the premier weather setters for each weather, and only one team uh, out of the three boards uh, drafted these Pokemon. Each one got drafted once. Hepaudon got drafted twice, but I fully chalked that up to Hepaudon being a strong and bulky ground type. I don't think it was really drafted for its synergy much at all. It was taken with, um, was it taken with the old uh, Lycanroc? Yeah, on one of my practice teams, but I don't think it was really being seriously considered um, for its weather potential nearly as much as just being a strong and, and uh, bulky ground type with recovery. The other wetters, though, wetters? Weathers have clearly fallen off. Bombasnow, Torkoal, Tyranitar get relatively good usage on the ladder um, and have such clear synergies in draft, it's very interesting that they didn't end up getting taken. Worth asking, I'm asking myself, worth asking yourself as well, why is it that these weathers have fallen off so much? Is it just that they don't have the right users for them? Because, you know, Torkoal, Tyranitar work totally on their own. Pelipper, I think, makes more sense, but, you know, weather lets you draft in a vacuum. Is it because my team did so bad it made playoffs but was mocked by tay so much last season that people are afraid to draft weather perhaps i've highlighted here the three teams that have real weather modes uh no offense to to sora i wouldn't really call snover and glaceon a um full-on hail mode you can bring those two and it is hail up and hail is going on but it's still pretty easy to counter those with a make it rain from from me or poppin or you know a heat wave from anything um even with terra you're losing your ice type and then losing your defense boost same thing with obama snow and glaceon without having that speed boost i think it's really hard to see how it's a a full-on weather team compared to the teams that do have speed abusers and weather setters in um tyranitar and lycanroc midday uh Daddy's team with Satitan and Sloking, and then Mono's team with the full-on rain. Mm. Even then, two of those three are cores, so really, in the whole entirety of BBLS, we've only got one dedicated weather team, which is such a fall from grace, I think, from, from Generation 8. What that says to me is that speed tiers are still important, but those, those frail, fast Pokemon that are mainly strong for their weathers, it's not that people are worried about their weathers being reset because that was more common in the Dynamax era. No, I think it's actually that um, people are trending towards having bulkier options because if your opponent can just tear it into the resist for your Pokemon, you know, Barrascuta is way, way, way worse when anything can turn into a grass, water, or a dragon type. Trick Room. Taking a look at Trick Room setters. Here I've highlighted all the Pokemon that I would call reasonably high tier dedicated trick room setters um bronzong frigiraf hatterene mimikyu 
Oranguru, Slow Twins, Spiritum, and Giraffe Rake. I don't know why I said it like that. Um, you can see these Trick Room Setters really are pretty in demand. Two out of three boards taking Slowbro, Giraffe Rake for Giraffe, and Bronzong. Three out of three boards taking some of the Taunt Immune ones. Covert Cloak, I think, is clearly the culprit of that with Hatterene and Slowking. Uh, and then, you know, just one out of three boards taking Mimikyu, Oranguru, and Spiritomb. I think, to me, what this says the most is really Mimikyu, Oranguru are too high tiered if you're not taking them for Trick Room. That's all they do. Instruct is much worse um, without having the speed advantage. Um, you need Oranguru to be that Trick Room setter. Uh, Spiritomb as well, really now that it has trick room that is its main niche i think most of these other pokemon have other things they offer right so people are looking for versatility and they're looking for a trick room setter that can output offense on its own a bronzong if it's real slow it has gyro ball for a giraffe with i'm not going to say twin beam psychic moves hyper voice off i believe 110 special attack hatterene obviously being a strong sweeper sloking as well having that with also having the chili reception support for any ice steps in the back slow bro as well I suppose the one curiosity would be Giraffe Rig being drafted twice. Um, it is possible that the other time Giraffe Rig was taken was on my practice draft board. Uh, I'm going to check that real quick, like. Here's our VBLS document. I'm sure it's going to be difficult to see. Giraffe Rig was in four points. Was it taken? It was taken by me here. And it was taken... by nobody here. Got it. So two of those three picks for Giraffe Rig were me. Cool. That tells you <laughs> that's more of a Jace bias than anything else. I'm glad I figured that out. Oh, I wish I figured it out before the video. Moving on to some combos. Notably, that slacking Grafai combo only got taken once. I think that must just be because those guys are too expensive. Although I think in general, people are leaning more towards teams without those overt combos. Um, and have more interest in a broad team with um, applications uh, across many, many different situations. Uh, a team that allows you to be both offensive and defensive. I think that also comes down to Terra at the end of the day. You can only play so dynamically when you're using a combo like Slacking Grafai Eye. Uh, and when your opponent always has the option to surprise you, catch you off guard with their Terra, it's better to have more options for switching in, switching out, um, manipulating the state of battle, and, and positioning without needing two Pokemon at the same time. A couple combos that did get taken, though. Every Masquerada across the three boards got drafted alongside a Tauros, and Dondozo and Tatsugiri got taken on all three drafts. Now, I think that's probably because Masquerada and Tauros are good Pokemon on their own, and having that strong synergy just push them over the edge. Um, Dondozo Tatsugiri, I think that's probably the bias from them being so popular on ladder. I personally would not have taken them, considered it, I think all of us considered it, but I think that one, more than anything, really just comes down to them having such a high ceiling of ability that slacking doesn't doesn't quite get to. Uh, worth noting as well as terrains. Indeed, he was taken three times. Armor Rouge was taken three times, I believe. Um, neither together so there's no expanding force spam there's not really much psychic terrain abuse the ndd teams just have the one psychic type for the most part so that's more just setting it up for fake out immunity pinkurchin didn't get drafted at all and new rillaboom um, arboliva is not um drafted with any sort of like real obvious ground weak pokemon um or with any grass types to abuse it, so terrain, I think, has fallen off massively. We don't even have a Misty Terrain Setter besides, you know, an impotent Morgrim um, setting it with priority. Looking at just some limited resources, mm, there's uh, three things that I thought were really, really in high demand on this board more than anything else. That was Fake Out, Ground Types, and Fairy Types. But you can see, one, you can see my bias. Um, all my teams really prioritize those in my practice draft, more so than the uh, VBL community would have. But also, you can see just how many of each roster 
Uh, oh, Perry Zero is a good play. Wonderful. Uh, how many Pokemon from each draft board? Uh, how many teams from each draft board went without a Pokemon with these resources? Sorry, got a little tongue-tied there. Uh, but you can see still, these are limited commodities. People really went to the bottom of the barrel with their fairies, I think, you know, including stuff like Morgrim, including Doxbun. Uh, ground, five out of 12 rosters in the NU conference don't have a ground type. And I think some of the ones that do have a ground type have Toad School or Diglett. So definitely notable there, really missing out on those ground types, which to me is pretty scary and, and crazy because fire is a very strong terra type ground hits that super effectively it also hits steel the other like strongest terra type arguably you know ghost water um have have arguments to be made um fake out i think um is less necessary this league for sure um with covert cloak but still you know in demand want to point out one team that bucks all convention that uh, drafted this beautiful pokemon last season which is Bobbin's team, which he drafted while he was drunk, or at least some of it, um, which has neither fake out, nor ground type, nor fairy type. Uh, the absolute balls on this man are, are unbelievable. Um, no ground type, leaving him vulnerable to steals. Um, no fairies, leaving him uh, vulnerable to you know, fighting types, dark types, dragon types. No fake out, um, preventing him to, from being able to position, but... I wouldn't say this is a bad team at all. In fact, what this may be showing us more than anything is that Terra Blast and Terrasalizing make some players say, fuck it, I don't give a shit about my <laughs> my types at all. I've only got four Pokemon at once. I'm going to choose, you know, three Pokemon that work, and then my fourth guy, I'm just going to Terra into making a great four-mon combo. And this team definitely has enough resources with... Uh, the speed control options, uh, three tailwind setters here, uh, three wide guard users as well, uh, in addition to some some great solid typings on Pokemons, such as uh, Golden Go. Um, Dodunsparce, I would say, has a pretty solid defensive typing, uh, but of course the, the Slowbro and the Serena, as well as the Haxorus. The last thing I want to look at is some uh, connections that I've made between some team compositions. Um, you can look at maybe some lines that uh, drafters may have taken from a first pick going down to see some similarities in teams and how they got put together. So the first one is going to be uh, my 10th practice draft team and uh, Mr. James Alton Bell's Cincinnati Mancinos. You can see here, Mousehold, Gardevoir, Salamence, and a Pokemon from the Magnemite line are on this team. This is pretty clearly showing to me that Mousehold really wants to be paired with this fantasy core. Now, the question is why? It's not being paired with a top tier steel type, clearly, I think because they share the fighting weakness, uh, but I think also the Gardevoir being a fairy type and the Salamence being a dragon flying type makes it clear that it's uh, stacking a couple really good resistances to fighting um, along with Mousehold, so people aren't just able to throw out those fighting attacks freely. Um, Gardevoir also makes sense with Mousehold uh, having its ghost weakness being covered by that follow me. Uh, potentially also the Mousehold population bomb um, being walled by steel types. Potentially this is a, a technique of using a fairy type and a dragon type as well as a steel type to put pressure on those steel types, forcing people into bringing their steel types, and then boom, I terrestrialize my Salamence into a fire type and I cook your steel. Now you have no resist to my population bomb or my Gardevoir. Uh, potentially. You can also notice these uh, teams went for a low-tier Trick Room Setter and a mid-tier uh, five-point water type. I think that pretty much tracks with these teams. Um, you know, somebody who's drafting in this style of getting a real versatile, strong marquee piece that is normal type is probably going to be scrambling to complete their cores near the end of the draft. And you can see neither of these teams ended up with a grass type. But the core of the uh, Fairy Dragon and Steel make a lot of sense. Uh, with the water type really being a glue piece that is being prioritized after getting that first core in there. And then the ghost type low tier trick room setter complementing the Gardevoir well. So the Gardevoir doesn't have to run trick room every week if that's the direction you want to take it. Um, these teams having Mousehold being a, a fast Pokemon. I guess Mousehold really is one of those redirectors that can work with trick room. You know, you can set up your Mousehold next to an Armor Rouge, let your Mousehold die, and now you've got trick room set up. 
but it's more a Pokemon that you want to be able to bring for redirection sometimes and bring for offense sometimes, and sometimes both, so getting in Trick Room is not so good. Because your Population Bomb isn't going to be doing much if you're already dead. Moving on to Jordan's team, we share some similarities with um, my team number three. It had the same first two picks. I think it's a pretty clear synergy. Annihilate. On ladder, it's oftentimes used as a Scarfer or with um, that incredibly powerful Final Gambit, but I think in draft you really want to be utilizing it more, keeping it on the field for a while, and nothing's going to get you those Rage Fist boosts faster than weak hits, which Arcanine excels at. Arcanine is one of those Pokemon that is probably top five in VGC history at damage control. I remember watching a lot of games in early Sword and Shield with long played out Arcanine Snarl versus Snarl endgames, um, and Will-O-Wisp, Snarl, uh, Intimidate off of a 95 speed makes Arcanine top tier for that. Plus, it resists fairy type attacks. You can see also these teams prioritize a 7 point water type. Um, it's not immediately obvious why you take a water type with Annihilate. Uh, Annihilate really not being walled by anything, but, but fearing, you know, flying types, ghost types, psychic types, and fairy types that are coming at it. And you can say, you know, um, my team 3 has the Corviknight for the steel type, but Jordan really didn't prioritize a, a, a fairy killer too much. The water type is interesting, I think, because these teams start so strong, but they want to continue down that bulky offense route, and they want a, a glue Pokemon um, to hold things together. And I think that's what Azumarill or Rotomwash are doing. You've got your Annihilate, you've got your Arcanine, you've got your pretty clear, obvious mode, but you need to threaten from another angle um, to force people to stretch out their prep, which means fewer super effective attacks into Annihilate, which means more weak attacks into Annihilate, which means stronger on the Rage Fist. And the final uh, teams I want to compare is all three of the Hydreigon teams. All three of the Hydreigon teams also took the Water-type Tauros. That's crazy to me, personally. It makes sense. A bit uh, Tauros beating Fire, Steel. Steel make, makes sense. Uh, ground, Dark-types. So Dark-types who are also resisting the Hydreigon. I think it is somewhat... Um, what would you call it? Uh, coincidental that these Pokemon ended up together, but perhaps the, the most obvious reason for that is just the synergetic uh, typings. Offensive fighting type, offensive dark type, really hitting a lot of types of for super effective. Pangoro has great coverage, Urshavu Dark has great coverage. But you can also see two of these teams took Gengar as a strong poison type to take out the fairies that are threatening Hydreigon and Tauros, and two of these teams took Scizor. Magnezone also being a strong, super strong, um, steel type to take those out. I would even go so far as to say, this could be a recommendation for Sora. I know you love that Glaceon Snover pair, but, well, I wouldn't really recommend dropping Glaceon. Perhaps, if that Snover isn't putting in work, finding some way to get a poison type on this roster would be super helpful. Although, you could, uh, Terrasalize Hydreigon <laughs> into a poison type would really be the one, um... Does it get Sludge Bomb? Is it just Belch? I'm not sure. I don't think it gets Sludge Bomb. Anyways, um, those are some of those clear similarities. Hydreigon with its weaknesses covered by the Poison and Fairy type. Poison and the Steel type, killing the fairies. I've also got two of these teams with a Florgis, uh, two of these teams with a Flareon, two of these teams with a low-tier um, Fire type. All these teams paying five or six points for an Electric type. Um, you know, James could... Uh, James, not James. This isn't James' team. James' team was the first one. Sora um, could give more info, and I apologize, coach of the Apex Lola Marowax. I am not yet associated your team name with your player name, uh, and I'm doing a display capture, so I'm not going to change Windows to Discord. Uh, but those coaches could potentially talk about, you know, the way they follow these lines, having a, a strong fairy killer, having that ice type, um, having that Tauros, having that like, mid-tier electric type. Uh, again, could be coincidental, but I think there's learning to be taken here. Definitely a lot of pressure being put on on those steel types, for sure, is one thing that you can definitely point out here. Yeah. So, uh, that is the end of the presentation. We looked at the draft board as a whole. We looked at some trends across the drafting, and we looked at some teams that had similarities. Um... I would love to know 
if you take a look at the uh, docs, which I will put in the description of this video, if anything stands out to you guys uh, that I missed, um, trends across these three draft boards, things we can learn about the format. Um, I don't know if I've shared anything new uh, with you that you didn't already know, but um, if I did, um, I'm glad to have contributed a little bit to our knowledge, um, and I hope you enjoy this video. Thanks so much for watching.